Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. I am your host, Vic Sinise. And if you're watching us live, welcome to the show on the live side. Um, be sure to use our comment box. If you have any comments or questions to make for during the show, we'll be glad to post those. If this is your first time checking us out, be sure to go to our website at euronurse.com to learn more about the show. It's also the best place to go to watch all of our past episodes. And boy, oh boy, we got a bunch of them. 88 episodes up there for you guys to watch. Hey, want to watch us in your car? Watch us in your car. Listen to us in your car. Check out our podcast, our audio podcast at Euronurse Plus. You can check us up, check us out on any of those formats and listen to us in your car. If you're a patient and then you're watching this, no problem. But be sure to check out our Euro Patient podcast, which follows this show at 1030 a.m. every uh, Saturday. Europatient.com, your place to go if you're a patient to learn more. This week, we're going to talk about PSA, and it'll be a pretty interesting show. If you're not getting our email, it comes out every Monday with more information about the show. Go to our website and register for the email. We use MailChimp, which makes your email perfectly safe. Nobody ever sees it. This week, I'm going to be talking about uh, favorite subjects, circumcisions, male or male. They're all male circumcisions. And uh, but child children or neonatal and full term ones. Oh, boy. All right. So let's go ahead and not have me chew it up anymore and bring our experts in here. And uh, Lori, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Hi, my name is Lori Atkinson. I'm a certified urology registered nurse. I have been a urology nurse um, for 25 years now, and I currently work at a large urology practice in Winfield in Geneva, Illinois. Happy to be here. Right. Good. Welcome to the show. And of course, I'm Vic Sinise. I mentioned earlier, I'm the host, producer, and creator of Euronurse. Been involved in urology for the past 40 years, and always fun to, to talk about different things that you're involved in. And it's kind of neat because some of these shows that I'm actually giving are things that uh, I've done in my past, probably haven't done recently, such as assisting on circumcisions, but it's always fun to go and look back and kind of talk about different subjects. So I'm going to be talking about circumcisions today. So if you have any questions about that, be sure to put those into the questions. And I'm going to switch a few screens here to get us set up for the show. All righty. And that actually worked. Good. Let me just get my name tag out of the way. Perfect. So <clears throat> circumcision, when, why, and how. Now, if you're looking at this uh, picture that I used, and I was lucky to find this picture, what do you see? Potatoes or penises? If you're seeing penises, you may suffer from paradiolia. What's that you say? Well, that's when you start seeing different uh, shapes in clouds, rock formations, and yes, even potatoes. Um, it's a psychological phenomenon, and that's what it's called. So now you know, you learn something new. What does it have to do with circumcision? Absolutely nothing. I just thought those were neat pictures. <laughs> now, circumcision goes back thousands of years and is deeply rooted in cultural and religious reasons, um, as well as some medical traditions to why we do that. There's always pros and cons to everything we do. And I'm sure if we asked this group of uh, guys sitting here to raise their hand, if they wanted a circumcision, we would not see too many hands go up because babies have no choice in the matter. We make that choice for them. And that's probably one of the, the cons that we may talk about. But why do we have the pros for it? So properly performed circumcisions prevent two big problems that we can have as an adult. Not common, but they can occur. Phimosis and paraphimosis. We're going to talk about what those are shortly. But there's another thing that they have completely prevented, and that is um, penile cancer. It's almost unheard of in the U.S. where circumcision is practiced highly. Now, although penile cancers, as we see here in these pictures, are, are pretty rare, they're, uh, they represent about 1% of all malignancies in the USA and Europe. The big difference is they are pretty significant in uh, public health hazard in developing worlds. So why do we uh, jump on the bandwagon for doing circumcisions to prevent cancers? Well, we look back at a group that practices circumcision pretty religiously, no pun intended, um, and does the most, Israel. So circumcision is well you know, rooted into their, their traditional culture and religion, and they perform the most. 
And lo and behold, they have the lowest rate of penile malignancies at less than 0.1%. So worldwide, normally 1%, theirs is a tenth less than that. 10% less, you know, 0.1%. So with that low number, it kind of struck people to say, hmm, maybe there's something to the circumcision and started the practice of circumcisions throughout the world. Um, in Africa, they've done some studies because there was concerns about uh, sexually transmittable infections. And they found while there was no effect on the rates of syphilis or gonorrhea in the African nations, they did find convincing evidence that there was about a 50 to 60% reduction in HIV transmission between a HIV negative man and an HIV positive woman. So that kind of led to some um, thoughts for why we should be, again, looking at circumcision, especially in some developing nations. So I spoke earlier about phimosis and periphimosis, which can exist if you don't have a foreskin. Um, phimosis is when the foreskin narrows and covers the head of the penis and paraphimosis is when the foreskin is retracted and left that way. So in a non-circumcised patient often referred to as the gift they get from their doctors or nurses. And that's because you go to put a catheter in, you pull back the foreskin to put it in. Whoops, forgot to put it back. And next thing you know, is you'll see what the, these pictures will show shortly, it blows up and becomes a, a real medical issue. Um, so this is what phimosis looks like and I'll get my pointer in here. So you can see, you barely can see the head of that penis peeking through that foreskin because it's so scarred. Now this is a child, um, in adults, we think the reason that, or we know the reason that that occurs is because things like diabetes where the urine is really sugary and it sets up a perfect field for bacteria and fungal infections that can cause scarring. So the treatment, again, is is a circumcision for that or something called a dorsal slit where you just kind of put a slit through here to help open that up. And I've seen this before where it, it, the patient will be voiding and this happens to be a pediatric patient, but I've seen it in adults too. And the foreskin's so tight that it fills up with urine like a balloon. And then it just kind of seeps out of the balloon as it empties out. So obviously this is somebody who's going to definitely be needing a circumcision. Now, again, this is paraphimosis. This is in a child. And then this one is an adult. Um, again, as you can see that there's a band, when you pull back the foreskin, there's a tight band that can sometimes cause strangulation of the, the return of fluids. And it becomes very edematous here. And this should be treated and reduced as quickly as possible because a lot of times you can reduce these. And I'll show you my trick for how I do them. Um, but when they can't be done, you know, then sometimes a, a dorsal slit has to be done or that ring has to be cut. So tend to turn into surgery, but when properly reduced, they go away pretty quickly and look pretty normal afterwards. So most important message here is especially for our nurses and doctors out there. When you do a, a catheterization, make sure you return that foreskin if they're not circumcised. And, you know, sometimes you might say, oh, that's like a no brainer, but some patients who are, are not circumcised look almost like they're circumcised. So you don't really realize that they are. And so I always ask the patient, are you circumcised? And if you're not sure, make sure you get that skin back over the head. So who is it that actually does our circumcisions? Well, the bulk of these are actually done by the ob -gynies. And that's because at the time the baby's in the nursery before they go home, this is performed. And they're experts at it. They're really good at doing these and they do the bulk of them. But the urologists do happen to get a certain number of them. So maybe the baby goes home for some reason without being circumcised. Maybe the parents make up their mind later on that they want it done. All different reasons that it could be uh, why it's delayed. Um, sometimes there's a medical reason. Um, in particular, I, my oldest son, there's a familial risk of hemophilia in our, in our family. My wife's side of the family has hemophilia. And although she was tested ahead of time and they thought it was pretty certain she didn't, the final test actually was came from cord blood of my firstborn son. And then they were able to rule it out as that she was not a carrier of the hemophilia gene. Um, so he had to have his delayed. Those are often the ones that get sent off to the pediatric urologist for circumcision or the plain urologist. Urologists can all tend to do these things. I was lucky enough to work with a pediatric urologist there. You can see he's sitting in that uh, position there. Uh, it's kind of neat because they have a few tricks and 
I think that are different than most. So I'm going to share some of those since I did a lot of circumcisions with that guy. One of the things is good equipment. You, these are done in the office. So this little board here is a, a must. You have to have some kind of restraining device. And these things right here, these little restraints, you can buy extras of those. And then just, oh, I just ran mine through the autoclave to sterilize them between patients. Because sometimes you'll be doing more than one circuit a day. So you want to have the ability to do multiples. You can wash the board down and just change out those straps. I can tell you out of all the things that the patients don't like, this is what the little babies hate the most being restrained. So, but there's some tricks to that too. And I'm going to go through those. The other trick is what you use to do a circumcision. Um, our pediatric urologist was pretty set on using this thing called a GOMCO device. That's what you see pictured here. There are some other methods of doing it. Um, there's some plasti bells and things like that, but this one is the surest and safest uh, to prevent any injury to the head of the penis. You know, you're cutting a pretty small area, so you don't want to cut too much or too little. Now, the difference between the guys doing them in the hospital and our pediatric urologist, as he would brag, is they have the complete set. And there's probably, a, I think, somewhere around 10 or 20 different sizes of this GOMCO system. And we carried the entire set. I will admit that most patients use the 1.45. An interesting quick story is the uh, urologist that I worked with, this pediatric urologist, had retired from our practice probably about 10 years ago. And I haven't talked to him since he left. I decided to get ready for this talk. I would just kind of go through a few things with them and call them out of the blue. And hey, we had a great time just chatting and catching up with each other's lives. And so some interesting stories that he shared with me, I'll share with you. So the other thing that's really important, I think this is, again, maybe what separates regular urologist and a pediatric urologist is the use of a pacifier. You say a pacifier, why would you give them a pacifier? Well, you know, they used to give cowboys a stick to bite down on before they did surgery. The least we can do is give this little tyke a pacifier. But actually, there is some really, really good studies out there about the endorphins that are released by the brain from the action of sucking on a pacifier. And in my uh, my research, I found some um, a study by the Canadian Pediatric Society called the Prevention and Management of Pain and Stress in the Neonate. And it refers to the use of a pacifier as a simple comfort measure to be used whenever possible for minor painful procedures. I can tell you, as soon as we put this guy in restraints, I got that pacifier in their mouth and they were just sucking away on that and they were happy as a clam. <clears throat> a lot of times they'll fall asleep during the procedure because that's being tied down is the part they hate the most. So consider that pacifier. Another interesting part of the story in my research, I also found that there was some stuff about SIDS being um, prevented by the use of a pacifier. And I just I think I announced last week, I just had a new granddaughter and uh, actually went to see her yesterday. I was telling my daughter about the study and she said she had read it too. She's a teacher, so she reads those things. And yep, pacifiers being used. Whether it prevents SIDS or not, I'm not sure, but we'll find out. Um. So the other thing we use is something called Sweeties. This is the one I forgot about. He reminded me. Sweeties is a sucrose solution. You can buy it. It comes in little containers. And what you do is we dip the pacifier in that, and it makes it sweet. <clears throat> they love it. They go sucking on anything like crazy. Now, there have actually been some studies that show a synergistic analgesic effect when you use oral sucrose and the pacifier. So that combination seems to work better than one alone. But if you only have one or the other, just giving them the sugar solution did not show to be better than the pacifier. The pacifier was actually the better of the two. So definitely give them that pacifier and, and they'll be happy as they can. Now, this was something new that I didn't know about. And he had told me we never did this when I was assisting. But he said, yeah, I says, there's some new research that came out. Um, it was done in NICUs. They studied this. And that's the use of lullabies another endorphin releasing product. So turn on the lullabies, give them the pacifier that's dipped in that sugar solution, and you're going to have one happy baby. The study that they referred to was they had played lullabies and they played Mozart in the NICU. And what they found is the patients, the babies who were listening to the lullabies slept better, had decreased heart rates and respiration rates. And less days in the NICU. So probably some pretty good research for doing lullabies. And hey, who doesn't like a good lullaby while you're working? And then the final thing that we do is anesthesia. Now this is uh, um, 
something that wasn't done in the past. You know, they used to do these things without a, a penile block. Um, but it's been pretty well proven that you should give a injection of lidocaine to the penis to prevent pain for these. And we always did it when we did the circumcisions in our office. Um, so there was a couple of theories going on that children don't feel pain or infants don't feel pain. They don't have the nerve sense down there. That's not true. They feel pain. Trust me. Um, the other one was, you know, it'll toughen them up if you do that. So giving them, you know, that first shock of pain in the circumcision will make a better man out of them. And actually there has been a study that was done that disproved that. So what they did is they looked at boys who were circumcised with a local block and those without a local block and their tolerance of their immunizations. They rated it their pain scale. And those that did not receive the block, they were the ones that felt more pain during the immunizations. And I think the theory is that some pain channels are opened up when you expose an infant to pain. And there's some probably some imprinting and stuff that gets that occurs from that. So use anesthetic. Uh, we use lidocaine, 0.5%, and then you have to dilute it to the patient's weight, to the infant weight. I don't remember the formula offhand, um, but it's based on what the maximum amount of lidocaine you could give if you injected it directly into the carotid artery and the amount that would cause a serious side effect. By the way, the serious side effect with lidocaine is seizures, just so you know that. The other thing is make sure that you use a 30-gauge needle. That's a really small needle. Um, because it'll uh, prevent injury to any blood vessels. Even if you were to stick a blood vessel on a little baby with a 30-gauge needle, you will never get a hematoma. I, I could tell you, we never had a hematoma with the use of a 30-gauge needle. So that's important. Um, now I have a little video of how this procedure is done, and we'll go ahead and play that now. So... This is a kind of neat, I found this online. They've got these rubber um, things that you can practice on so you don't have to practice on a real baby. The hardest part of a infant circumcision is the adhesions because they're not getting um, that break, you know, the foreskin coming back and breaking those down like you do when it's an adult. So there's a lot of adhesions you got to get through. This shows uh, the dorsal crush where you just kind of take a hemostat and crush the skin so that when you cut through there, there'll be no bleeding. Again, this baby had received the block before all this stuff is done. They're, they're not doing a thing. They're just like on that pacifier, happy as can be. And then importantly, to place that plastic bell in there and the proper size bell is really... Um, most important. So you have to kind of make sure you got the right size bell. Like I said, 1.45 is what we found works best, but sometimes you have to use a little bigger, a little smaller. And if you've got all the sizes, you can get it perfect. The Goldilocks rule. And you can see this other part goes over there and you're able to kind of pull the foreskin up and the bell covers the head of the penis. So you can't injure it when you're cutting. So it's perfectly safe. Really pretty hard to, to I say it's almost foolproof. And then you screw down this clamp and it crushes the vessels and seals everything. So you don't have to use any sutures. This Everything is sealed. The most important part, you can cut the foreskin while you're waiting. Look at your watch. Make sure you get three minutes of time because it takes three minutes for platelets to aggregate so that there's no bleeding. So you have to have the clamp on for three minutes. Some people get a little anxious because you can cut this off and go to the next stage pretty quick. So make sure you wait that full three minutes before you loosen that up, loosen it up. And there we go. A little Vaseline dressing and that little guy's ready to go. Now, unfortunately, there's not always uh, every circumcision that goes uh, perfectly as planned. There have been some side effects and problems that can occur. And that's probably why the pendulum swings left and right about whether we should do circumcisions at all, you know, if there's injuries and things that people say, why did you ever do that? If it, everything is preventing all the problems like phimosis, I can tell you there's not a patient who's had a phimosis that didn't wish they had a circumcision. So, um, but it does swing the pendulum. So what are some of the immediate risks that you can see while well, bleeding? So again, if you don't leave that crushing on for the right amount of time, or some of these other procedures can have more bleeding infection. Anytime you do any surgery, some injuries to the penis, buried penis. I'll show some of these pictures, meatal stenosis, skin bridges, corday, 
And sometimes it just doesn't look the way it should. So here's our first one. This is a uh, adhesion. And as we can kind of point out right here, so we, we see this is nice. That's where the circumcision should be. And it should be the whole way around. But this is adhered. The skin and this part of the, the coronal uh, edge have mended, molded together. And it's kind of like a half circumcision. Most of these, that would have to be redone. A skin bridge would be like this little area right here sometimes. That small area can just have a little connection. It's called a skin bridge. And those can be treated you know, pretty easily in the office. A little shot of lidocaine and a little snip and it's gone. So those can occur. This is a phimosis post the circumcision. So the skin actually probably wasn't enough skin removed in this particular case. And the skin now has scarred over the head of the penis. That's going to be a reduced circ for sure. This is what buried penis looks like. This is a severe form of phimosis with the penis being completely buried. And the big problem is there may not be enough uh, skin to make this, uh, to do this, redo this and make it proper. So sometimes that can be a big issue fixing these. Um, this was a Plasti Bell patient. That's a different object. We don't use those, but it was misplaced in the, on the mid shaft and then removed and then the wound opened and got infected. And that's kind of what you worry about with a post-op in, post infection there. Sometimes the circumcision, that area where it should have stayed sealed, doesn't stay sealed, breaks down for some reason. It's possible. Uh, I can say I don't think I've ever seen any of ours do that, but it can happen. Um, most of the time you just let it heal, and then sometimes you may have to go back in and do kind of some cosmetic repair. Corday is when the penis is kind of bending because the skin is a little too tight on one side. And the biggest concern that people point to that are um, about why we shouldn't do them it is informed consent. How does an infant give informed consent? Well, obviously they don't. Nobody gave them their choice of whether they wanted this done or not. And there is a dilemma because these kids grow up and some patients or some people have had a circumcision suddenly regret they ever had a circumcision. There can be complaints. They feel that the sensitivity isn't there. It's harder to climax. And they think it's because they don't have a foreskin. And maybe that's the truth. So there's actually now a move where you can do foreskin restoration. Yep, it's a real thing. You can do tissue expansion from just stretching the skin. And that could be as, you know, taping it down, strapping it down, putting weights on it, pulling it over with your hands. And if you put enough traction on skin, it will grow. So it, it's possible. Um, the other thing is just surgically, they can find skin somewhere else and make a new foreskin for you. And I'm not so sure how that's going to help sensitivity problems or issues because it may be something else. But anyway, it can be done. It's out there. So we're going to switch now to adult circumcision and sharpen those pencils. Why do we do adult circumcisions? Almost always it's because of a medical issue, a phimosis or a paraphimosis. So again, just to kind of um, talk about it, we, we kind of mentioned what the phimosis was when they're scarring due to probably infection. But let's talk about the paraphimosis when the skin gets trapped behind, their foreskin gets trapped behind the head of the penis. As we said, that can occur because of a catheter placement and failure to replace it. The whole trick is to work on this as fast as possible to get it back, get that uh, penis head covered by the foreskin. And you can just sometimes just squeeze that area that you see right here, and that'll help to pull it, the fluid out of there, and you can push it back in. Um, I'm going to show you a technique I call the, the push with your thumb, pull with your finger. I used to make uh, rounds every morning before I started clinic at the hospital that we were on staff at. And I can tell you that I was called in many a times to check a, a swelling after a catheter was placed and it was paraphimosis. So I got pretty good at replacing those. But anyway, this is a technique that I like to use. And it's fingers are, are back behind that, that kind of adebitus area and thumb pushing on the head of the penis. The whole trick to this is patience. It, it's not going to go fast. What you're trying to basically do is get this fluid to kind of squeeze out of that area. And it will. So it's kind of a steady pressure, as you see here. We're just steadily applying pressure with our thumbs, kind of pulling the skin back over the head with your fingers. This is showing a little, you can sometimes pinch some of that fluid out to get the fluid to relieve. And you're pushing, pushing again, being patient. 
one of the big problems is sometimes you think you reduced it and you really didn't. You got it to go kind of inside, but that you'll you'll kind of feel when it pops through that that uh, ring of skin that's that it's getting stuck on. And we're getting close here. So again, we're just kind of pushing, pushing, and it all of a sudden just pops through and you can feel the foreskin come over. And, you know, this is done without anesthesia because the patient's already in pain. We're not really increasing their pain. Um, and the relief of having it done is so great that they're all pretty happy once it's done. So pretty simple to do. Um, again, sometimes it doesn't always work. So then they either need a circumcision or a dorsal slit, or sometimes we just cut that little ring of, of skin that's trapping it. Um, again, here's a picture, what we had mentioned earlier about phimosis. So that's the penis is trapped by this skin that got infected and scarred over. And this is a nice little video on how to do a circumcision. Adult circumcisions were my favorite because I got to assist with those too. Um, and there's a lot, you'll see that it's probably one of those procedures that goes a lot quicker if you got a second set of hands. So that's, that was me. Now, this is a neat one. I found this video on the uh, internet. Where else do you find these things? And it's a rubber model that you can practice on. So there's no bleeding here, which is kind of nice. It's not a real penis, but it looks pretty good, pretty similar to what you work on. They're, they're showing this being drawn into where you're going to do it. And that's kind of marking off so you avoid cutting the skin where the frenulum's at. And again, you place hemostats. Now, this is done under that same local block. So it, lidocaine in the base of the penis will numb the whole penis down. And then you get some hemostats around the foreskin to help hold it. That's usually where the second person is kind of helping to retract skin. As you can see, they're kind of pulling. And then you make this coronal incision right behind the coronal area. Again, we never marked it, like I said, with a marker. You could kind of, we would typically do what part you're going to see coming up shortly where they do the, the cut down from the center. There, they're cutting around to, again, avoid the frenulum. So let's just see that little groove there. So I, th I think it, it's kind of nice here because you don't see any, like I said, there's no bleeding, but it does almost look like they're cutting through real flesh. It does have two different layers. Yeah, oh, we're getting there. So this is the area that I spoke about where you can cut down the center. Now we always smashed, did a, a smash. We hit, put a hemostat on that first to stop the bleeding. So you smash the skin. It won't bleed when you cut through it. Trust me, if you just cut it like that, you'd have quite a bit of bleeding. So best to use a hemostat first. Then you can kind of peel it back and finish your cut. As you see them doing here. What you don't see is because the, a lot of these little bleeders are, are oozing that we use a cautery. So we're, we're cauterizing as we go along. Anytime there's bleeding, as a assistant, I'm usually touching the, you know, kind of using the, the four by four to clear up the bloody field and they go in the cauterize any little bleeders. And then it's done by, it's closed by, we use chromic sutures. I don't know what these, this white suture is probably just because it shows up better. But chromic is a self-dissolving suture, a 3 chromic, about the right size for this. And the uh, incision is, or the, the stitching is done. We do separate stitches all the way around the entire foreskin area, reattaching those two. And this is where a second person comes in handy because as one stitches, the other can cut. It goes a lot faster. And you're going to see that's what it looks like when we're finished. Got all these little things around there. We'll put a little dressing around. Again, Vaseline dressing. And we always tell patients to wear their penis up to prevent uh, the swelling. So kind of use your underwear to hold your penis up. And it helps to keep the area from swelling, restrict your activities, etc. Um, and those stitches don't have to be removed. They come out on their own in about, uh, seven to 10 days. Same set of complications that we noticed with the, the infantile 
circumcisions, bleeding, infection, pain, discomfort, swelling, bruising, delayed healing, scarring, all these meatal stenosis, they can all occur anytime. Now, unique to this one, which is something we don't typically see, or of course, we don't hear about it because the infants can't complain about it, is change in sensation. And we do see that. Um, so one of the big concerns is because the penis has been covered all this, all its life, and now all of a sudden it's exposed to underwear and things. A lot of times that the head of the penis is more sensitive because it's not, doesn't have a nice cover over it. And patients will complain about that. Um, there's also been some studies where they compared men that were circumcised before puberty and then men that were circumcised during adolescence or later, and they rated sexual pleasure at the glass penis. And some have reported that there's less sensation, harder to climax, as I said, some discomfort in the penile shaft. So you name it, there's all sorts of complaints that come out. Um, they did this on a study of about a thousand men. Uh, they, they got a thousand men who were uncircumcised and then 300 that were circumcised uh, to kind of do this analysis. So not a huge study, but again, there was some note that there were some lower sensations and more difficulty orgasming found in this study. But like I said, the biggest complaint that uh, we noted was with some patients, not all, was this complaint of, you know, the penis just kind of feeling more sensitive as it hit the underwear. I think over time it toughens up. But one guy in particular, true story, one guy in particular was complaining about how much it was bothering him. I think he was kind of driving his wife nuts. He said it felt cold. It really bothered him. So his wife had this unique situation where she just was a knitter and she decided to knit a little hat for his penis. True story. And because uh, he quick, he was complaining about the sensitivity and feeling cold and he put his little hat on his penis and was happy as he could be. So. With that, I'm going to switch over my screen here and get back to our group picture because we are done. Hey, all right, Lori, welcome back. I think you're. I think you're. You're uh, muted. Sorry about that. I was uh, laughing because I. Uh, that that's hilarious. I have never seen that. <laughs> it's the stocking cap. <laughs> right. The other thing that made me laugh was that I think that we could use the pacifier and the sucrose on adult males too, in many circumstances. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, exactly. I had a question um, and maybe this is because it's more precise, I guess, but why don't they have those devices like they do for circs for, for newborns or, you know, for infants the... for adults instead of, yeah. you know, having to cut them. Um, I mean, they're cutting them either way, but I'm just wondering if it's just because it's more cosmetic or. Yeah, uh, good question. I'm not, I'm not uh, sure I've had a good answer for you. <laughs> I've never seen the, a Gomco clamp that would fit a, a, an adult male. Yeah, I mean, I'm so, sure it would be rather large, I suppose, but I was just curious. I think a lot of times probably too is the, you know, the amount of scarring and stuff, because as I said, most of the adult circumcisions are not being done for, you know, cosmetic reasons or you know, for cultural reasons, those were all done as children. They're because of phimosis or paraphimosis that can't be fixed. So you're, you're dealing with something that's kind of hard to get in there and get a, a Gomco type device on. Right. So it may exist, but I, I, I can tell you, we did a lot of circumcisions. Um, that's how we did them. They were gotcha. always done like that. Yeah. I, um, I've seen many, I mean, I haven't seen circumcision. So in 25 years, I have never seen how they did it. So thank you for that. Because, you know, even though you're in neurology forever, it's just something I don't see because I don't, we, I don't, yeah. I personally don't do peds, you know, we do adults, but they always go to the OR, of course. Now, right. as far as paraphimosis is concerned and phimosis, oh boy, there's a lot of them. Um, yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that I was just last week, teaching staff, a new, newer staff, or now we're allowing our MAs to straight cath where we never did before. I mm -hmm. was teaching them on a male simulator how to do that. And one of the things I brought up is that, you know, just make sure that you reduce the foreskin, pull it back over. Um, and you'd be surprised at how many people don't know that even, you know, you see it from the ER all the time. ER nurses yeah. can, you know, it happens to them. Um, patients don't have a clue. You know, we've had patients come to the office 
and they'll be sitting there going, oh, I'm having all this pain in my penis and blah, 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 blah. And then you look and you're like, um, are you circumcised? And they're like, <laughs> no. And I'm like, oh, OK, well, uh -huh. I got it. I know why you're in pain. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was great. Thanks. I thought it's kind of interesting that they kind of they they say it's a gift from your nurse or doctor because it's true most of those are caused by us so inadvertently right. and I and I I have to admit I've done it before I come back yeah. and I'm like oh crap you know guy comes yeah. in I'm like you were circ you weren't ever circumcised he goes oh no and I'm like oh brother <laughs> so, have have you reduced those too I have and I use the same method that you do. Um, mm -hmm. First, I'll, but first, I'll try to kind of reduce the swelling by wrapping it with some roller gauze, you know, yeah. tight, and then I hold it and hold it for minutes and minutes and minutes. And you can actually see the swelling, um, yeah. you know, go to another area. And then as soon as, you know, I feel like the, the area where you're trying to do the, that whole, you know, um, yeah. pop, whatever. Um, through that ring. Yeah. Then I'll do the whole thumb and, and, try to pull it and it's not easy and it, it does take a lot of patience for sure yeah yeah and i think you know always a question is this a, something that's within the nursing uh um bounds of you know what we can do and it's certainly we're not doing any surgery there it's it's just uh replacing a foreskin so yeah i think i i, I mean i did learn from our physicians of course and it i mean yeah should, i don't yeah, know if it's really taught. Yeah, I don't know if it's really within the nurse's realm to do it, but when you're in that situation and you don't want to wait for a doctor, because the longer you wait, the worse it's going to get. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think that my docs, they they trust that I, yeah. you know, I've done it before, so and I've seen it yeah. a million times, so I I do try to do it, and I get yeah. I'm successful for the most part as long as you catch it early enough, you know. Yeah, that and that, I think that's the real key. Is that it's something that most patients can be spared an operation if you get to it early enough. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen them where it's so bad you just can't even hardly find where it's at. And we've the only way to do it was a dorsal slit, and then you cut that ring and it thing pops right through. So it's really kind of neat. And for those that aren't familiar with the dorsal slit, you're basically cutting the foreskin in a V shape and then sewing those edges together. So it's kind of like an incomplete circumcision. But, uh, you know, for an older guy that, you know, maybe isn't sexually active, that say, saves him going through a full circumcision. And, yeah. it and you know, I was always told early in my career, my urology career, that there's very few um, urology emergencies. And that's actually one of them. You yeah. know, that, that's, an, that's an urgent matter. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and there's no question. It's, it's painful. These patients come in because of pain and swelling, not just swelling. So. Have you ever seen where it's um, it's it's over that time period where it's almost it's basically too late and they've lost blood flow to the tip of the penis? And and where it's necrotic. Fortunately, yeah. I have not. But that's a, that's yeah, the worst case scenario. Is you can get necrosis from that. So long term. I think it's because it's so painful. I think people, you know, yeah. obviously get in quickly for that. So. But I mean, you know, diabetics that would possibly have less you know sensory or somebody with spinal cord injury that maybe has no no sense down there it's possible so it's uh it's a it's a moment for patient education too i think when you're de dealing with a man who's not been circumcised with a catheter is educating him i always tell patients you know it's part of their how to keep it clean you know pull back clean around the tip of the catheter but make sure you replace your foreskin it could mm -hmm. swell i think if you give them that information that's uh it's something that'll be preventable for them. For sure. Yeah, we do, we do some co cosmetic, you know, some men that obviously weren't circumcised as babies come in later mm -hmm. in life and they're, they, they do it because they, it, it's usually their partner that wants it. Um, right. More they, than themselves. They don't think it looks right. So. Right. Right. And I've had some patients think uh we talked about sensations that they thought the foreskin was decreasing their sensation so they wanted it removed for better sensation right by the way for our viewers out there if you have any questions feel free to put those into the comment box no matter how you're watching us we'd be glad to take your questions you guys are free to ask away or or if you got a story to share about your own experiences let us know we'll be glad to put those post those on the show if not It'll be a little bit shorter show. That's fine too.
kind of be interested how you how how much uh, people are doing circumcisions out there is it common in in our practices do you do them as outpatient inpatient we uh in our practice we started out they were always done in the hospital so everybody was an outpatient um i don't know that they they still did them under local most of the time they didn't have to give i mean once you give a block to the penis they don't really feel anything um but when i joined the the group i was the first nurse to join our practice and one of the urologists there was a group of three that i joined and the one guy was really uh, kind of at, at the forefront of what I think happened in most of the urology now is said, you know, why are we going to the hospital? We're wasting people's time. We're wasting my time. He says, I've got a nurse here who can assist. He goes, let's start doing these things in the office. So we started moving all this stuff into the office that was traditionally done in the OR. And Adults, you mean, as yeah, well? Wow. Adult circumcision. We started doing those in the office and it was, you know, really patients kind of liked it. They didn't have to go to the hospital. Again, once you give a block, it's really not any pain that's different in the hospital versus the office. As long as you have all the right equipment, I think it's, you got a second set of trained hands to assist with the procedure, holding, you know, clamps and things. It, it really works out well. So we've had no problems, no higher infection rates than hospitals get. So it was really a successful thing. And as I saw more and more things moved into the, from the OR to the office. Yeah. A lot of things are, are moving <laughs> yeah. to the office more that you would never in a million years believe that you could do it in the office, but. Do we have any questions that come through that you can share? Oh yes, we do. As a matter of fact. All right. Susie. Do you have any tips, <laughs> Susie? You're hilarious. No pun intended for bringing back the foreskin after a catheter change. Yeah, that was that video I was showing. That even though there was no catheter in that, same thing. It's just the uh, you know the the pressure and pulling back, pushing with your thumb, pulling back the skin with your fingers. Sometimes just if, if it's right after a catheter change, it should come back pretty easy. It's when it swells up that there's a problem, but. Even sometimes you just, you pull back the foreskin and it does get stuck. I, I think that's probably what Susie's referring to. I've had that a few times. And sometimes you just pull the skin over and you didn't get past that, that ring, that ring of tissue that causes the constriction and they'll swell up. So I'm always really, I mean, it's, it seems kind of, you know, weird, but I always kind of make sure I push the head of the penis. So I know I could kind of feel that it's behind that ring of tissue. And yeah, I've be, even uh, I've done that um, method with with the catheter in, you know, yeah. as opposed to, you know, you don't Absolutely. have to take it out or anything. You could just, you know, do it with it in. Yeah. Um, and then we have April that said we perform more dorsal slits. We have older population. Yeah, I, I think that's a great, a great point. You know, I, I meant to put a video or, or at least a clip of the dorsal slit, but it's a mini circumcision. Like, as I kind of showed, it's just a V slit. Um, all you do is take that hemostat, you crush down the center, cut through, and then sew those edges together. And it just fillets everything open just as good as a circumcision without going through the whole formal ordeal of removing all of the skin. Right. Heal faster. Plus, again, these are diabetics who don't always heal that well. So, right. Um, and Nancy, I cannot recall the details, but an article in your, uh, your logic nursing was about a clamp used in Africa applied by the RN that slowly over a week would cut through the foreskin. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, there is. I think that's kind of how this, uh, they use this thing called a plasti bell and that's sort of how that works. They, they, it's, it's a, I never assisted with it, so I didn't talk about it. But it's kind of that same situation. You pull the foreskin over this plastic bell thing, and it just over time disappears or cuts through it. So wow. yeah, there is there is something like that. Again, I never had experience with this, so I didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. I don't see any other questions coming in. So let's go ahead and put our plug in for next week. I hope, I hope I'm not boring anybody, but I'm going to be speaking next week. Um, and I've got a really good subject for us next week. This should be fun. I had fun making it, so let's see. Dick and Jane have lumps and bumps is a cautionary tale that navigates the complexities of sexual health with candidness and sensitivity. Through the lens of Dick and Jane, the narrative explores the potential consequences of engaging in unprotected sexual activity. 
it underscores the importance of regular STI testing, communication, and informed decision-making within intimate relationships. Their story serves as a poignant reminder of the significance of sexual health education and the necessity of destigmatizing discussions surrounding STIs. Join us next week on Neuronurse.com. So yeah, be sure to join us next week to learn more about STIs and fun with Dick and Jane. So uh, we'll see everybody next week on Euronurse. Have a great, beautiful weather today, folks. Go out and enjoy it. Um, I don't know how the weather is by you, but I'm in the Chicagoland area. And it is so bright and sunny. It's supposed to be almost, I think, 70 degrees today. So get out, enjoy that day. Thanks, everybody.